Welcome to the lecture series of Public Theology, a cooperation of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology, the Bayersnau Day Center for Public Theology, and the Lutheran World Federation. Politics, Democracy, Civil Society in a Globalized World by Dr. Florian Höhner. Slide number one. Hello and warm greetings from Berlin. My name is Florian Höhne. I work as a researcher and teacher in theology and ethics at Humboldt University in Berlin. In my career, I also worked as a journalist and I am ordained minister to the Lutheran Church of Bavaria. In my research, I focus on media ethics, on ethics of responsibility, and on public theology. I am grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today about politics, democracy, civil society in a globalized world. This, this title includes many important big buzzwords. So, let's start to talk about it. Slide number two. Some Christians hold that Christian church and faith were not political. Churches should focus on preaching, praying and spirituality and not interfere with politics. Other Christians have claimed that their faith is inherently political and makes them struggle for political aims, be it left-wing or right-wing, be it in favor of liberation or be it in favor of authoritarianism. Hence, the relation between Christians, church and faith on the one hand, and politics on the other hand, is highly contested. It is one task of public theology to reflect that relation. Public theology can be understood as, quote, theologically informed interdisciplinary discourse on public issues and the scholarly reflection thereof." Unquote. Obviously, this includes the relation of Christianity and politics. One outcome of the discourse of public theology has been the insight that theology and the Church cannot be non-political. There is no neutral ground to refrain from political engagement necessarily is political too. If one makes being a Christian only about preaching and singing behind the walls of the church, one has taken a political position that strengthens those in power and makes things go on as they always have been. Theology and Christian life cannot be non-political. That's why a discourse is needed that makes the political implications of Christian life and theology explicit and available for further scrutiny and critique. This is the task of public theology. In order to do that, it helps to get one's terminology clear. What are we talking about when we talk about politics or democracy or civil society? In this very lecture, I want to give you some brief insights in what these terms mean and what all of that might have to do with theology, Christian faith, and the Church. Slide number three. Let's start with politics. The term entails the ancient Greek term polis, which means as much as city or state. In a broad meaning, politics refers to all matters of communal or common life. It is in this broad sense that John H. Yoder could write about the politics of Jesus. Political scientists often use the word in a more narrow sense. Then, politics refers to the, quote, production of commonly binding rules and decisions in and between groups of people." Unquote. For example, under which conditions 
Should there be abortions? Politics refers to the production of laws that answer these questions for everybody in one country and in a binding way. Binding means if you don't follow this law, there will be sanctions. Another example. Should there be health insurance for everybody, independent of income and personal conditions? Politics produce a regulation binding for all. It could, for example, bind everybody to solidarity with each other and oblige everybody to pay for public health insurance to the me measure of his or her income. Production of commonly binding decisions. Since the 1970s, it is It has become usual in political science to distinguish three dimensions of this production. Policy, politics, and polity. First, policy. The production includes the actual content of decisions. What options do we have to decide in a political issue? What concrete measurements are possible to regulate public health insurance or abortion, for example? This is what the policy dimension is about. Second, politics. The production includes the process in which decisions are made, legitimized and enforced. Politicians and lobbyists discuss issues or compete for power. They do so in public or hidden to the public. This process of decision-making is called politics dimension. Third, polity. The production also includes structures, institutions and cultures that make those processes possible. The institution of a parliament, for instance. The constitution that assigns certain rights and duties to parliamentarians. Or the political culture of how to discuss things in the plenary. The structures are referred to as polity dimension. Hence, the ingredients structure, actual process and contents form the production of commonly binding decisions. Slide number four. This understanding of politics, polity and policy comes with little normative implications. It doesn't challenge the production of decisions to be democratic, transparent, participatory or in another way legitimate yet. But it already allows for sorting the possible relations that the church, Christian communities and Christian religion have two politics. First, Christian orientations can play a role in debates on the content of political decisions. This is the policy dimension. For example, Christians can draw the preferential options for the poor from biblical narratives and take that as a reason for voting for public health insurance because it gives the poor access to medical treatment. Second, the process dimension. Christian virtues can play a role in the process of producing political decisions, truth-telling for example, and the respect for others are crucial for a participatory process of decision-making. Both can be motivated by biblical narratives. Third, the polity dimension. Christian institutions and organizations are part of the structures that made politics possible. In, the, in religious lessons at school or in congregations, people learn the skills they need to participate in politics. Depending on the legal system of a country, religious institutions sometimes play an official role in politics. Hence, 
different relations between Christianity and politics can be observed on the level of politics, policies, and polity. While seeing and describing always already has normative implications, theology does not stop here, but provides explicit normative ori orientations for how the relation of Christianity and politics should be structured. In the different denominational and contextual branches of public theology, different models are discussed. There is the Two Kingdoms doctrine from the Lutheran tradition, natural law teachings in the Roman Catholic tradition, or the Kingdom of Christ doctrine in the Reformed, particularly the Bathian tradition. The time is too short here to elaborate further on all of these models. But I want to show you how one prominent model works. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer's idea of the three possible causes of action of the Church. In times of political crises, faced with the merging authoritarian rule of anti-Semitic fascism in Germany, Bonhoeffer spoke about the political responsibility of Christians and the Church in 1933. In this speech, he affirms the necessity of a state and politics theologically, the existence of a state and therewith commonly binding rules and decisions were an order of God in a fallen world. Christians could affirm the, affirm the existence of the state as something that creates order and gives rights. Bonhoeffer goes on by distinguishing three possibilities the Church has over against the states and politics. His core idea is Christians affirm the existence of a state because it maintains order. But this because also gives them an orientation for dealing with the state. They do know about the task of the state and politics, and that is to maintain order and to defend everybody's rights. In terms of this, the Church knows about the limits of the state. It must neither create too much nor too little order, as Bonhoeffer puts it. In, on the one hand, the state must not create too much order by interfering with the freedom of faith. A theocratic state that establishes its own religion or tries to determine the practices of the church would trespass this limit even if it is seemingly Christian state. On the other hand, the state must not create too little order, for example, by scrapping parts of its population of basic rights. The state has to defend everybody's rights. Knowing of this legitimate task of state and politics, the Church has, according to Bonhoeffer, three possibilities of actions. First of all, the Church needs to hold the state responsible for fulfilling its task to create order and defend rights of everybody. If politics try to determine people's religion or strip people of rights, the Church needs to remind politics of its tasks and ask for its responsibility. Secondly, the Church cares for the victims of political actions. Its social work and pastoral care exercise this. The third possibility Bonhoeffer sees is the most contested one. Normally, he claims, the Church should not act politically itself, directly political itself. But if a state fails in creating order and defending minorities' rights, the Church can act political itself. In 1933, Bonhoeffer says the consensus of a Church Council is necessary for that. Hence, 
While there are different theological models that provide orientations for how to see the relation between Christianity and politics, Bonhoeffer's thinking provides the idea that the Church knows of the theologically legitimate function of politics, and that is, to create order and defend people's, particularly minorities' rights. This gives grounds for the Church to remind the state of its function to care for its victims, and to elect, act politically itself in the emergency case that the state does not fulfill its function at all. Slide number five. Today, most states in the world want to be democracies in some way, as the political scientist Horst Pretsch has said in German words even if they are authoritarian. Being such a widespread ideal, it is crucial to ask, what is democracy? The originally Greek term democracy means rule of the people. Hence, the basic idea is, it is the people that produce commonly binding rules and decisions. It is the people who control and legitimize those rules and decisions. As simple as that might sound, the tricky question is, what does it mean for policies, polity and politics to be democratic? Different countries and democracies all over the world answer this question differently. The ruling of the people always works somehow by elections and majorities. Most democracies are representative democracies. The people elect representatives who speak in parliament, decide about laws and policies. And or the people elect their government or administration. Many countries have fewer or more elements of direct democracy. That means the people do not only elect representatives, but also vote on single policy issues directly. Hence, democracy means that the people should somehow produce political decisions and rules. They are the source of legitimacy. An important element of theories and realities of democracy is what has been called civil society. While there's a vast discourse with different definitions of this term, key to the concept is in one branch are the following characteristics, which have been summarized by Joachim von Sosten. Characteristic number one. Civil society refers to associations which neither are organized by the state nor serve primarily economic purposes. Understood this way, civil society refers to an entity between private individuals on the one hand and the state on the other hand. It describes a space of voluntary associations. Its networks of communications are neither controlled by the state nor only by economic interests. Second feature. As a space for voluntary associations that are neither merely private nor organized by the state, civil society refers to the social entity that constitutes the public sphere, or, to be more accurate, a multitude of public spheres. The democratic ideal is that these public spheres function as a space for discourse in which people form and transform their political opinion and supervise the activities of their elected representatives and their government. In this line of thinking, the public sphere is the counterpart of the state through which the rule of the people emerges. Third feature. According to Soßen and Darendorf, the possibility of civil society depends on two conditions. On the one hand, people need fundamental rights of citizens to participate in this public sphere and to do so independent of the state. They need freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom to have one's own opinion and criticize one's government, freedom to gather 
and form associations. On the other hand, people need cultural and moral resources to participate in the public sphere and in civil society. Virtues of civility and citizenship, of non-violent discussion and reasoning, for instance. Hence, crucial for many modern theories and realities of democracy is the existence and concept of a civil society not controlled by the state, but functioning as its counterpart on which people associate voluntarily, form and transform opinions and control politics. They need rights and cultural resources for that. If public theology affirms democracy as a non-perfect but relatively good political system and understands society in light of the ideal of a participatory civil society which allows for political discourse, then public theology will reflect on the new role of the church, of Christian communities and traditions. It needs to be sensitive to the plurality in society. Most present societies consist of people with very different ethnic, religious and cultural backgrounds. At some places Christian are the majority, at others they aren't. Hence, theology and churches have to integrate the sociological perception that they are just one tradition among others, one association among others in civil society. Already in 1972, the German public theologian Wolfgang Huber has emphasized this. The church also has to understand itself as one association in a society in the midst of many others. For Christians and church representatives, this means that they can offer orientations from Christian traditions. They can try to convince others, but they have no legitimacy to force anyone or act as if they knew the truth. It is also means that church is, from a sociological perspective, part of civil society. Here she is co-responsible for upholding political culture, for reproducing the cultural and moral resources for peaceful and just living together. Hence, from this standpoint, the church can only contribute to the political process and the discussion of policies as one part of a plural civil society. Slide number six. In the history of Christianity, different denominational and theological traditions have taken different positions on democracy. For example, Reformed theologians, particularly in Switzerland, were early to affirm democracy as an option compatible with Christian orientations. German Lutheranism took a little longer to find its way. As early as 1948, on its first meeting, the Ecumenical Council of Churches discussed the vision of a responsible society which can not only be understood as a theological plea for democracy, but also for a participatory civil society. Quote, Man is created and called to be a free being, responsible to God and his neighbor. And any tendencies in state and society depriving man of this possibility of acting responsibly are a denial of God's intention for man and his work of salvation. A responsible society is one where freedom is the freedom of men who acknowledge responsibility to justice and public order, and where those who hold political authority or economic power are responsible for its exercise to God and the people whose welfare is affected by it. For a society to be responsible under modern conditions, it is required that the people have freedom to control, to criticize and to change their governments, that power be made responsible by law and tradition and be distributed as widely as possible through the whole community. It is required that economic justice and provision of equality of opportunity be established for all the members of society. 
We therefore condemn any denial of men of an opportunity to participate in the shaping of society, for this is the duty implied in man's responsibility towards his neighbor." Unquote. This far the 1948 Assembly of the Economical Council of Churches. This is a vision in which people have the democratic, quote, freedom to control, to criticize, and to change their governments, unquote. A vision that gives individual, the individual the right to participate in civil society. At least for the last 10 to 15 years, public theology has been a global discourse which connects theologians from different countries all over the world. Where it deals with politics and policies and polity, its topics and its argumentations are often similar or to or identical with those who have been discussed in the ecumenical movement. The concept of a responsible society, for example, or the conciliary process for peace, justice, and the integrity of creation. Theologians and church practitioners have thought about issues of social ethics and politics in a global discourse and within a global horizon. That seems adequate in a globalized world. Economic, cultural, and political processes all over the world are interconnected. This is not only true when it comes to international conflicts. It also holds true for the way economy, like economies work. On this background, it makes sense for theologians and church practitioners to discuss political issues in their context, in a global and, theologically spoken, in an ecumenical horizon. Hence, particularly in the globalized world, public theology has an ecumenical dimension. Thank you very much for your attention and all the best. Peace and bye-bye. Discussion questions. You can discuss the following questions. Topic number one. How does the relation of church or Christianity on the one hand and state or politics on the other hand look like in your context? How has it been relevant in your experience? Topic number two. Repeat Bonhoeffer's concept about the task of the state and the task of the church. Discuss whether you agree with him theologically and how relevant his thinking is. Topic number three. What does it mean for the church to be one community alongside other religious communities in the society? 